Welcome! In this video, we will be learning about bond polarity and electronegativity. So in the past, we have identified types of bonds by looking at the elements that are involved in making them. So a compound that has a metal and a nonmetal, we say is ionic, and a molecule that has two nonmetals, we would say is covalent. We can also use electronegativity values of the two atoms in a bond to help us classify bonds as either ionic or covalent. So this is another way to do that classification. And we have some rules to follow here, that if the electronegativity difference is greater than or equal to 1.7, we consider the bond ionic. And it still has to be made up of our positively and negatively metal and nonmetal charged ions. If that electronegativity difference is less than or equal to 1.6, the bond is considered covalent. And it has to be also composed of nonmetals. And this will give us a spectrum of what our bond might look like. So if we have a difference in electronegativity of 0 up to 1.7, we consider our molecules to be covalent, and greater than 1.7 we consider to be ionic. And remember, our electronegativity values are all found on table S in our reference tables. So we can look for the actual values there and compare them to determine if we've got a covalent or an ionic bond following these rules. We can also determine the character of the bond. So if we have a large difference in electronegativity, or greater than 1.7 or close to 1.7, we might say it has more ionic character. A small difference in electronegativity indicates that the bond has less ionic character. So this is a real spectrum here, where if we have a difference in electronegativity of zero, we have covalent bonding. And as we move up the scale, we get increasing ionic character as our electronegativity difference increases until we get all the way to a full ionic bond. So within our covalent bonding, there's going to be a range of bonds that have less ionic character and more ionic character. We can think of our bond polarity in terms of ionic bonds, so we remember that an ionic bond is an electrostatic force of attraction between a positive and negative ion, and they're going to be formed when an electron is fully transferred from a less electronegative element to a more electronegative element. So an example here is sodium. The sodium atom transfers or loses its electron to our chlorine atom, and we end up with a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Those two can then form an ionic bond. In our covalent bonds, we can use our electronegativity values to classify these bonds even further. So we can have nonpolar covalent bonds, and this is a covalent bond between two atoms that have the same electronegativity values. It's usually going to be the same exact atom. So both of our atoms share a bonding pair, and they do so equally. And to do this, the electronegativity value has to be zero. And a nonpolar covalent bond is said to have a symmetrical charge or electron distribution within the bond. So if we look at this example here, we have our nucleus for one atom, maybe this is a hydrogen atom, and our nucleus for our other hydrogen atom, and this shows us our electrons that are around those two atoms, and they're pretty much split equally in between the two of them. And we can think of covalent bonding as a little bit of a tug of war between those shared pairs of electrons. If we have two nuclei that are exactly the same strength, they're going to be able to pull their electrons in the same pattern. And we see this type of nonpolar covalent bond in our seven diatomic molecules here. 
those are all made up of two of the same exact element. They're going to have the same exact electronegativity values and they're going to share their electrons equally between them. Things are a little bit different in a polar covalent bond. So in a polar covalent bond, we're going to have two different nonmetal atoms. And this is going to give us a difference in our electronegativity values. Again, which can, we can find in table S on the reference tables. And when we have this difference in electronegativity values, we get an unequal sharing of electrons in a covalent bond. Remember that electronegativity tells us the ability of an atom to pull electrons towards its nucleus. The higher the electronegativity value, the better the atom's going to be at that. So when we have a polar covalent bond, we say that we have an asymmetrical or electron distribution. So it's not going to be the same on both sides. This example here of hydrogen and chlorine. Hydrogen is very small. Chlorine has a lot more protons in it. It's going to be able to pull electrons closer to itself. So in a tug of war, chlorine is bigger, right? It's going to have more strength to pull more electrons towards its side of the molecule. And we can see this charge distribution. This is where our electrons would be. More of them are over here on the chlorine side than on the hydrogen side. The chlorine's just going to be better at pulling those electrons towards itself. So we see that there's a difference there and we call this a polar covalent bond. The electrons are shared, but it's unequal. And there's a range here for our polar bond. The greater the electronegativity difference, the more polar the bond, right? The greater the asymmetry in our shared electrons is going to be. So as our shared pair of electrons is drawn closer to the high electronegativity atom, we get something called a polarized bond or a dipole. And we've seen dipoles before. There's dipoles in magnets with a north and south end. And we can also see dipoles with a positive and a negative charge. So in our atom or our molecule, the atom with greater electronegativity gains a partial negative charge. It's not a full negative charge because we're not completely transferring the electron. And we can show that on our molecule drawings with a charge. But we want to indicate that it's partial. So we use this symbol lowercase delta with a minus next to it. That tells us that we have a partial negative charge wherever we're drawing that. For our atom that has lower electronegativity, it's going to get a partial positive charge, right? The electrons are being pulled away from it, but not completely. So it's partially positively charged, so we do a lowercase delta with a plus sign next to it. And we see this type of example in water, which is H2O, in a covalent compound. We have a structural diagram here where we have, right, this is a shared pair of electrons here between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Again, hydrogen is going to have lower electronegativity than oxygen. It's a little smaller, has fewer protons in its nucleus. So the electrons are going to be pulled towards our oxygen. So our hydrogen in this bond will have a partial positive charge. So we can draw that delta plus, And our oxygen will have a partial negative charge over here. So we can indicate that on our drawings of our molecules to help us think about if we've got a polar molecule or not. So we can try some examples here. What bond is most polar? Here we're going to need to look up our values for electronegativity on table S and find the difference in between them. So for the OH bond in H2O, oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.4 and hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.2. So the difference between these, if we do 3.4 minus 2.2, gives us a 1.2 difference in electronegativity. We can compare that value to these other compounds here. So here we have sulfur, which has an electronegativity value of 
2.6, hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.2. So if we do 2.6 minus 2.2, we get 0.4 is our difference. Same thing for our selenium and hydrogen. Selenium also has an electronegativity value of 2.6. Hydrogen is 2.2, and our difference is going to be the same as before. So we have electronegativity differences of 1.2, 0.4, and 0.4. The most polar bond is going to have the greatest difference. So our most polar bond here is going to be the OH bond and H2O. That's it for this lesson. We can determine the character of a bond by looking at the electronegativity values of the atoms that make up our bond. And we have a whole spectrum of covalent bonds to ionic bonds. If we have a difference that's greater than 1.7, we consider that bond to be ionic. And if it's less than 1.7, we consider it to be covalent. Within our covalent bonds, we can have nonpolar co covalent bonds where there is zero difference in electronegativity. And we can also have polar covalent bonds where there is a difference in electronegativity. These are all important pieces of our molecule. The sides of the molecule that might have a partial positive or negative charge are going to have implications in how that molecule might interact or react with other things. So it's important to be able to use our electronegativity values to characterize our different types of bonds. Good work today. I'll see you next time.